Good morning. We've already heard some uh, wonderful scripture. Uh, and we have at least one more, and I'm sure several more coming during the sermon today. Psalm 56, 1 through 13 says, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime, will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. This is the word of the Lord. Someone is having fun in the nursery. <laughs> I want you to take your Bible and open, if you will, please, to Acts chapter 23. And we're going to begin where we left off last week at verse 11. What Bart just read for us from the Psalms is very much in parallel with what we're experiencing in the reading of the word today, but also the weeks prior. Just as David was running from the enemy in hiding because the enemy sought to kill him, Saul, who is now Paul, has been in Jerusalem, and it's the Jews who are rejecting him and who are angry with him, thinking he has abandoned the law of Moses, the, the uh, sacramental laws, the ceremonial laws, and they are after him. So let's pick up, if we can, in this passage. We'll start with verse 11, and, and just follow with me, if you will, as I read. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who had made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you... Along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. Just to pause for a moment, if you remember from last week, Paul is actually being held by the Romans. Uh, he's under arrest. And the Romans really don't know how to proceed. And so they had appealed to the Jerusalem council to handle the case with Paul. And that blew up in the, in, uh, the Jewish a council's face so now they don't know what to do and here in this plot to kill Paul they're saying send Paul back to the Jerusalem council now the son I'm, I'm sorry and now therefore you along with the council give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly and we are ready to kill him before he comes near so in the transportation of Paul they're going to assassinate him Verse 16, now the son of Paul's sister, did you know Paul had a sister? The son of Paul's sister heard 
of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune. And Paul the prisoner called me and he said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. And the tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. And then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready, 200 soldiers, <coughs> excuse me, with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for, the, for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect, Claudius Lysias, to his excellency the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to the council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you by before you what they have against him and the soldiers according to their instructions took paul and brought him by night to antipatris and on the next day they returned to the barracks letting the horsemen go on with him and when they had come to caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor they presented paul also before him on the reading on reading the letter he asked what province he was from and when he learned that he was from cilicia he said, I will give you a hearing when your accuser, accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's uh, praetorium, or praetorium. And since arriving in Jerusalem, church, let me say this to you. Since arriving in Jerusalem, Paul has faced setback. He has faced trial after trial. He's endured three riots, not a single convert in the entire time he's been in Jerusalem. Of course, none of this is necessarily surprising to Paul. Why? Because he was given fair warning by the Holy Spirit not, or not, to not go to Jerusalem, but that when he arrived in Jerusalem, that he would face persecution. Paul's ultimate goal, and he states this in chapter 19, verse 21, his ultimate goal was to return to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem... Go and see Rome. That was really what he wanted. Paul was a Roman citizen as well as a Jew. Dual citizenship. But even in chapter 20 that we've already studied, as he was at the port of Miletus waiting for the cargo ship to be unloaded, he met one last time with the Ephesian elders. And he shared these words. If you want to follow, you can. It's in chapter 20, verse 22. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, here it is, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city, he hears this, that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And then we find, if you go to Acts chapter 21, just go forward a little ways to verse 3, Luke records these words. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we 
sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit... The disciples were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And shortly after that, they arrived at the house of Philip, not far from Jerusalem. He was living in Caesarea. And a prophet named Agabus arrives from Judea. And he brings a clear message to Paul. Message in chapter 21, verse 11. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt... And, and his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people were uh, there urged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. So Paul, having now been in Jerusalem facing three riots, not seeing a single convert, and now having to be rushed out of Jerusalem by night, in order to not be taken and assassinated by these Jews who had made a vow to kill him. Paul's not surprised by any of that. In Acts chapter 23, verse 11, it says, the first verse we read, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem... So you must testify also in Rome. Paul, not being dismayed, I'm sure perplexed at, uh, in moments in Jerusalem. Can you imagine Paul preaching the gospel and nobody getting saved? That happened. Every time he meets with people, a riot breaks out. He's been arrested. He stood before the council. And now, as he is alone in the barracks, the Holy Spirit comes to him and lets him know you're absolutely in the center of God's will. All that has happened to you that is not good is from the Lord. Don't change anything. Don't look for human results. Know that God's results are happening. God is telling Paul that none of the confusion, none of the setback is, in, is hindering God's ultimate plan. Paul is very much still in the center of God's will. So now we come to that passage that we just read earlier, our passage today in chapter 23. It is a very challenging passage to preach. On the surface, <laughs> it doesn't contain any major theme. There's no mention of God in the entire text. There, there's no miracle. There, there's no focus in the text other than to tell you the details of Paul's transportation from Jerusalem over to Caesarea under Governor Felix. Not much to go on here. So after reading the text over and over and over again and praying and asking God, please, Lord, give me something out of this text, it, it, it hit me. This text is bringing full attention to the providential hand of God in Paul's life. And I want to talk to you this morning for the next few minutes about God's providential hand on Paul and also on your life. Each of us was created by God for God's pleasure. Did you hear that? Every human being, every human being, was created by God from the foundation of the world for God's good pleasure. Not for ours. And our ultimate goal 
in life should be to bring glory to God's name, not ours. This is how the world will know that he is God, by how we live our lives in service to him, hidden in the identity that we have in Christ. And being in his service doesn't mean that everything goes well, as all of us are aware. Amen? You ever had something you've tried to do for the Lord and it didn't end so well? Okay, that's pretty common. Serving the Lord will bring many challenges, many setbacks, which on the surface feel like we're off course. Even, the, even maybe thinking that God's somewhere far away, he's not near to me right now. But the reality is none of that is true. As we examine Paul's life, this is proved out beautifully. Paul is facing nothing but trouble and trial. He was told before ever going to Jerusalem, it's going to be bad for you. They're going to bind you. By the way, Paul will never be a free man again as long as he lives. His life now is completely different. He goes to Jerusalem, doesn't have any success in winning people to Christ by sharing the gospel, and he shared the gospel. He even gave his personal testimony in full detail. What was the result? A riot. Nothing seems to be going well as he serves the Lord. And it would leave us to think that God's not near. God's somewhere far away. God has forgotten Paul. That's not the case at all. So what in this story gives any sense of Paul's divine accomplishment? Everything has gone wrong. And again, here's what the Spirit said to him as he's now probably in that barracks contemplating, reflecting on all that's happened in Jerusalem, on all the comments that were made to him prior to arriving, on what he felt the Holy Spirit constraining him to do in Jerusalem. And he's putting it all together. And as he's there contemplating reflectively, the Holy Spirit of God speaks to him. And he says, take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. What is he saying? God's providential hand is upon you. Everything is working, not according to your plan, but according to God's. You're on track God is near. God has not forgotten you. You are fulfilling your mission on this earth while you have days to breathe. What we see should never be the focus of our service to God. Listen, you're not serving God because of a result, because it looks good, because it sounds right. You're serving God in spite of what it looks like. When things are good, you're serving the Lord for his purposes. When things go south and it just seems like nothing's coming together, you are serving the Lord for his purposes. Either way, it's the Lord. He's the purpose. He's the reason that you are serving. And interestingly enough, we have to understand that our God always has a plan. He is fully committed to carrying out his plan, often through our failures, through our setbacks, through our trials. In this room, every one of us are facing trials of some type. Some are pretty severe. Others would say, no, I don't really, my trials are, are really nominal. They're not that big of a deal. Believe me, they, they, you'll have a big trial if you haven't yet. They're going to hit. Why? In this world... Jesus said you'll have what? A little bit of trouble? He said much tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In that statement alone is the sovereignty and the providential hand of God at work. And I'm telling you right now, it's, it's, it's much more dramatic and fun when God achieves his plan through a miracle or some positive result. It's far less enthusiastic to walk with God through trials and to be faithful in service and not see a result. 
possibly never seeing God's unfolding plan. That, that, that doesn't excite anybody. But I'm telling you what, there's no difference between the two in God's work. He's doing everything he commits to do, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. Whether there's a miracle or whether there's a trial and setback. All of it is God's work. That's why it's important that we not forget our Lord's work is providential. I want to talk to you about that. Providence, write this down, the definition that we'll use this morning for providence. Providence is the supernatural will of God being accomplished through natural process and circumstance. Let me say this again. Listen to what I'm saying. Providence is the supernatural will of God being accomplished through natural process, natural circumstance. What is a miracle? A miracle is when God intervenes in the natural process, in the natural circumstance, and shows up with a supernatural intervention. God intervenes. God changes the course of nature. That's a miracle. Providence is not that. Providence is God not changing anything in the natural realm, allowing the circumstances of life to come, and yet still, through those terrible circumstances, perform his perfect will. Let me say this to everyone here this morning. Isn't it, how many of you would agree? It's wonderful when God performs a miracle in my problem. Raise a hand. You, you agree. Amen. Everybody's hand ought to go up on that one, right? Well, guess what? That doesn't happen all that much. Oh, you're, you're doubting God. You're doubting what God can do. Oh, you, you're not a man of faith. No, no, no. Jesus is the one that you ought to be telling that to. Because Jesus performed many miracles while he was on the earth. And many of the miracles that he performed, people became enamored by the miracle and not what he said after he performed the miracle. So he didn't perform. The apostles did not perform as many miracles as they did obeying the providential hand of God. The providence of God happens every day in your life. Miracles happen every once in a while. You don't want to get focused in on the miracle. You want to focus in on remembering my God is in control even when I'm out of control. My God has this. My God can handle this. I'm not going to quit because things are difficult, because even though I can't see the result, God is performing his purposes through my life, through my problems, through my trials and setbacks. Providence is where God uses natural circumstances to accomplish his supernatural will. A miracle requires God to intervene or interfere in natural circumstances to bring about his will. Providence is where God provides protection care, a protective care in spite of the natural circumstances appearing to work against his will. And this is what we see here in this text that we read earlier in chapter 23. It's really about the providence of God. Nothing good is happening. And yet the Spirit comes and says, hey, you're exactly where you ought to be. You're, you're on course, Paul. Be encouraged by that. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Life has been difficult on you. Trials and setbacks and issues have come up, and you're like, where's God in all this? God is in the center of his will, performing that will in, in and through your life. God doesn't waste problems. God doesn't waste a circumstance. God doesn't waste a setback, a trial. God uses them. And here you are trying to run from the trial, run from the circumstance, trying to regain control of your life. And God says, you'll never have control of your life. I always have control of your life. I'm not saying to you this morning that God is causing you to sin that brings on a circumstance, okay? I'm saying that when you sin, and that circumstance is now your life, God will use that circumstance to change you, and he'll use it to fulfill his will. It's the difference between the Apostle Paul being stoned at Lystra and the Lord raising him from the dead. 
the Apostle Paul going to jail and the Lord intervening with a localized earthquake that only knocks out the whole jail. The whole jail. That's a miracle. Here in our text, you don't have any of that. God's name isn't mentioned, but all of the circumstances weave together to accomplish God's purpose, which is no less a divine work of God than a miracle. I love what Dr. Harry Ironside, a great theologian, said. He said, God is never nearer than when we cannot see his face. He is never closer than when we do not hear his voice. He is never undertaking for us more than at those times when his own name isn't mentioned. I'm going to read that, I'm going to read that again for you. Listen to what he's saying. God is never nearer than when we cannot see his face. He is never closer than when we do not hear his voice. He is never undertaking for us more than at those times when his own name isn't mentioned. We, we are so much controlled by the five senses. If I don't see God working, if I don't feel God working, if I can't hear God's voice, then I guess God's somewhere else. That is the opposite of the truth. you got to lay aside the five senses. you got to walk by faith and not by sight. True believers going through this world, which brings much tribulation, must walk by faith before the Lord to be able to believe that even in their worst day, God is very much at work. I would love to say to you that that his work in you is to just give you everything you've ever wanted and make you just so rich and give you a beautiful home over on the island and give you five garages for all of your sports cars. Actually, I wouldn't love saying that to you. It's a bunch of hogwash. God's purposes being worked in you are for his gain, not yours. Sometimes, as we are faithful to God in the circumstance that is difficult, God brings us through, and boy, do we grow up. We're more mature than we've ever been before in our walk with God. And God blesses us in some pretty unique, wonderful ways, doesn't he? And then there's situations like the Apostle Paul, who the Spirit comes and lovingly says, Paul, have courage. You're, you're doing exactly what God wanted. It doesn't matter that there's no converts. This is where God has you at this time. You're being faithful. And, and, and he's going to continue to perform his will and his purpose through you. Which, by the way, church, ended in martyrdom. It didn't turn out better for Paul in the physical realm. It got worse. But God didn't create Paul to fulfill Paul's purpose. He was created to fulfill God's. And Paul was good with that. I want you to turn in your Bible. Please turn. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I just want to read four or five verses here. We're not going to teach on them, but I just want to read it to you. And I want this to just settle into your spirit take it into your heart ask the lord to reveal and make make clear what this passage means the depth of it and by the way in a personal way help me god to understand this what you're saying to me through this passage romans 8 26 likewise the spirit holy spirit that is helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When you're at an impasse and just don't know where to go with it, even in prayer, I don't even know how to pray about this. Your heart's so heavy. The Holy Spirit is interceding in your behalf before the Father. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints 
according to the will of God. What's he interceding? What's the intercession that the Holy Spirit's lifting up on my behalf? That the purpose of God would be fulfilled in my life. And we know, now we have a right context for verse 28, which everybody memorizes and where most people get wrong, the understanding of the verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. When it says work together for good, that doesn't mean that you get what you want. It works together for your good that you are in the center of God's will, whatever that is. For those whom he, this, is, this ought to encourage your heart, this is a wonderful theology on sovereignty and providential care of God. For those whom he foreknew, those who are saved, God knew from the foundation of the world, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's God's destiny for the believer, to be conformed to Jesus. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, that Christ would be so vividly uh, uh, seen in our lives. And those whom he predestined in Christ, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So he's talking about salvation. He's talking about sanctification. And he's talking about glorification in heaven. This is the final destiny. Listen now, let me go back to verse 28. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? His purpose is that you be called, that you be saved, that you be justified by faith, not by yourself, and that you would be glorified when the Lord returns has nothing to do with your physical life turning out to be a success. has nothing to do with you being a president of a company. has nothing to do with how much money's in your bank account. has nothing to do with how many vehicles you own. It has to do with the purposes of God. He works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That means that life will never be perfectly ordered up no matter how responsible you are. That's because in ourselves we are incapable of controlling everything that happens to us and around us. But I've got some really good news for you this morning. Everything is already under control by someone far greater than you or I. Our God works through one of two ways, either through miracle or through providence. Miracles don't happen as often. Providence happens every day in your life, whether you see it or not. You can either surrender to that providence of God, or you can reject it and rebel against it and run from it. But God is still working even when you're running. He knew you would run. From the foundation of the world, he knew you would run. Man, would God not be a great gambler. If he went to Vegas, he would break the whole city. Forget about breaking the house. He'd break the whole city because he knows everything before it happens. He knows everything about your life before it ever happens. We walk around in such shame over the sins of our past. Oh, I just don't want... Pastor, Pastor Greg, when, when I get my life in order... I promise you I'm going to come to church. You'll never get your life in order. I'm one of the pastors of the church. There ain't a single elder in this church that has his life all together. We're just a bunch of broken, bruised scoundrels that God, by faith, saved because he saw in us from the foundation of the world that while we were going to sin and will continue to sin, he chose us. He called us. You're called. And if you're called to the Lord, then his plans will prevail. Now it gets real interesting as we close this down. 
So Paul is now under house arrest under Felix the governor. He puts him in Herod's praetorium to protect him. Paul has a little bit of freedom. Felix allows Paul to receive his guests and those who minister with him. They can come and visit him. And he allows Paul to write letters to those who he has ministered to over the years in the three missionary journeys. And now this gets really good. While he's in prison from now until the end of his life, especially when he gets to Rome, he arrives in Rome, he's put in prison a second time, and get this, he writes four special letters. Letters to three churches and to one man. And those four letters are in the Bible today. He writes a letter to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Colossus, and then he also writes a letter to Philemon. It was in his letter to the church in Philippi. Now listen, this is all happening after the Spirit said, you're in God's will. And the problems you're facing right now are part of my will for you. So now he gets to Rome, he's in prison, and he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. And he says in chapter 4, verse 11, I'll read for you, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. What's he saying? I've learned to rest in the providential hand of God at work in my life and through my life. That's where, look, if you don't know God, you'll never know contentment. If you're a Christian, but you don't understand the sovereignty of God and the providential care and protection of God and his, his will being fulfilled no matter what happens, then you'll never have contentment, even as a believer. Paul says it this way in verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to, be ab how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret to facing plenty and facing hunger, having abundance and having need. Here is the secret. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't care what I face, good or bad, it doesn't matter. My God is in control. And whatever he calls me to do, he will fulfill it. I'll get it done. When Paul spoke about learning to be content regardless of his circumstance, he was informing the church at Philippi that he knew God was providentially at work, not only in him, but in them. It had been about 10 years since Paul visited Philippi. If you remember Philippi, you might remember when he arrived, first thing he did was make a, a beeline for the, uh, for the synagogue. They didn't have a synagogue. Why? There weren't 10 Jewish men in the city. So the next thing he did was he thought, where would those who are God-fearing uh, Gentiles and Jews, where would they gather? Well, down by the water. So he goes down to the river's edge, and he meets a lady named Lydia, a businesswoman, a successful businesswoman. And on that day, Lydia hears the gospel in its fullness, and she, and the Bible says, her companions were saved. That is the founding of the church at Philippi. Paul subsequently was there in Philippi, and he saw a little girl who was demon-possessed with this power of, of divination, and he delivered her from that. Well, there were men who were making money off of this little girl, as she was telling fortunes. And when Paul delivered her from that possession, these men lost their, their money source immediately. Now they came up with some trumped up charges, charged Paul, and Paul was thrown into prison in lock and chain. What is Paul doing in prison in lock and chain in Philippi? After doing a good thing, following God's will and 
delivering this girl from this demon. He's getting closer and closer to the midnight hour. And the entire time he's in lock and chain, Paul is, he's praying, the Bible says, and he's singing. Singing what? He's giving thanks to God for his circumstance. He's praying, thanking God for a circumstance. He's singing, thanking God for the circumstance that he finds himself in. And at midnight, God, according to his providential care of Paul, sent an earthquake that only hit the jail. And Paul was set free. And just as equally exciting as the miracle of the earthquake was the providential hand of God in Paul's words to the jailer who was going to kill himself knowing that the prisoner had, had gotten loose. Paul didn't go anywhere. He stayed in the circumstance and he ministered to the jailer and went to his home and ministered to the jailer's household and all of them were saved. God's providential hand. God had to let Paul go to prison in order to fulfill God's will. I wonder how you're looking at your circumstance today. You're looking at your negative situation today because you've forgotten that your God is always in control and his will will include your circumstance. He won't waste it. I, I'm just so deeply moved by this. It caused me to turn in the Bible to Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, as Paul was writing that letter from prison in Rome. Listen to what he says in chapter 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake... I have suffered the loss, listen now, of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. Paul was thankful for the sufferings. Becoming like Christ in death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul was very familiar with suffering but he saw it as suffering for Christ, fulfilling God's will. And Paul, at the end of his life, being martyred, came to understand the resurrection of Jesus in his life. Paul is in heaven. The saints that are there with him from down through the generations and ages are not worshiping him. They are thanking God for him. For his faithfulness to deliver the word of God under circumstances that were beyond his control. And those letters helped save them because the gospel was communicated clearly. But their worship is to God. Just as the apostle Paul. Can you imagine being in heaven and you're standing next to Paul worshiping the Lord? You say, oh, I, I'm not worthy of that. You should be. You should be having the same experiences that Paul had. Being faithful to God, experiencing setback because of it. Maybe God's not going to canonize your story like he did Paul's, but your, your story is important to God. You're fulfilling God's destiny through you. Amen? That's why we live. You don't live for the miracle. You thank God when it happens but you live for his providential hand to be fulfilled through the natural 
circumstances of your life. Make sense? Let's pray. Father, thank you for taking a passage that just seems so difficult to preach and then by the illumination of the Spirit making it so clear to us that you're talking about your providence here. That you are always in control. That you're not looking for us to have control. That'll never happen. But God, we can trust you even when we cannot see you moving or see the result of your move. We trust you even though we don't hear your voice. We have your word that we can rely upon and put our faith in and adhere to, and trust in. And as we do, we walk with thanksgiving in our heart through this life of trial and circumstance. Giving thanks for the good days, the easy days, the days where great blessing and joy comes upon the believer, but no different than the day when it's difficult. The same praise, the same thanksgiving goes up to you. Grow us, Lord, spiritually, that we would live that way. Because that is how our Savior lived. That is how the Apostle Paul lived. It doesn't mean that we don't grow weary in well-doing. It doesn't mean that we're not discouraged from some circumstances that come out of nowhere. But we recover from those. And we once again put our hope and our faith in God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. We're going to sing a song. Let's sing together. It should be on the back side of your, of your sheet, your music sheet there. And then Brenton, at the close, will close us with prayer. But also know that we have elders and altar ministers who will come to the front. If you need prayer for any matter, we'd love to agree in prayer with you and pray for you. And take it to God knowing He has all things in His hand. Amen?